Confucius was a friend of Lu Shaji, who had a younger brother known as Robert Zhe. Robert Zhe, with a band of 9,000 followers, rampaged back and forth across the empire, assaulting and terrorizing the feudal lords, tunneling into houses, prying open doors, herding off men's horses and cattle, seizing their wives and daughters. Greedy for gain, he forgot his kin, gave not a look to father or mother, elder or younger brother, and performed no sacrifices to his ancestors. Whenever he approached the city, if it was that of a great state, the inhabitants manned their walls. If that of a small state, they fled into their strongholds. The 10,000 people all lived in dread of him. Confucius said to Lu Shaji, One who is a father must be able to lay down the law to his son, and one who is an elder brother must be able to teach his younger brother. If a father cannot lay down the law to his son, and an elder brother cannot teach his younger brother, then the relationship between father and son and elder and younger brother loses all value. Now here you are, sir, one of the most talented gentlemen of the age, and your younger brother is Robert Jur, a menace to the world, and you seem unable to teach him any better. If I may say so, I blush for you. I would therefore like to go on your behalf and try to persuade him to change his ways. Lu Shaji said, You have remarked, sir, that a father must be able to lay down the law to his son, and an elder brother must be able to teach his younger brother. But if the son will not listen when the father lays down the law, or if the younger brother refuses to heed his elder brother's teachings, then even with eloquence such as yours, what is there to be done? Moreover, Robiger is a man with a mind like a jetting fountain, a will like a blast of wind, with strength enough to fend off any enemy, and cunning enough to gloss over any evil. If you go along with his way of thinking, he is delighted. But if you go against him, he becomes furious. And it is nothing to him to curse people in the vilest language. You must not go near him. But Confucius paid no attention. And with Yan Wei as his carriage driver and Zhu Kung on his right, he went off to visit Robiger. Robiger was just at the time resting with his band of followers on the sunny side of Mount Tai and enjoying a late afternoon snack of minced human livers. Confucius stepped down from the carriage and went forward till he saw the officer in charge of receiving guests. I am Confucius, a native of Lu. I have heard that your general is a man of lofty principles, he said, respectfully bowing twice to the officer. The officer then entered and relayed the message. When Robiger heard this, he flew into a great rage. His eyes blazed like shining stars, and his hair stood on end and bristled beneath his cap. This must be none other than the crafty hypocrite Confucius from the state of Lu. Well, tell him this for me. You make up your stories, invent your phrases, babbling absurd eulogies of kings Wen and Wu, topped with a cap like a branching tree, wearing a girdle made from the ribs of a dead cow. You pour out your flood of words, your fallacious theories. You eat without ever plowing, clothe yourself without ever weaving. Wagging your lips, clacking your tongue, you invent any kind of right or wrong that suits you, leading astray the rulers of the world, keeping the scholars of the world from returning to the source, capriciously setting up ideals of filial piety and brotherliness, all the time hoping to worm your way into favour with the lords of the fiefs or the rich and eminent. Your crimes are huge, your offences grave. You had better run home as fast as you can, because if you don't, I will take your liver and add it to this afternoon's menu. Confucius sent in word again, saying, I have the good fortune to know your brother Lu Shaji, and therefore I beg to be able to gaze from a distance at your feet beneath the curtain. When the officer relayed this message, Robiger said, Let him come forward. Confucius came scurrying forward, declined the mat that was set out for him, stepped back a few paces, and bowed twice to Robiger. Robiger, still in a great rage, sat with both legs sprawled out, leaning on his sword, his eyes glaring. In a voice like the roar of a nursing tigress, he said, Confucius, come forward. If what you have to say pleases my fancy, you live. If it rubs me the wrong way, you die. Confucius said, I have heard that in all of the world there are three kinds of virtue. To grow up to be big and tall, with matchless good looks, so that everyone young or old, imminent or humble, delights in you. This is the highest kind of virtue. To have wisdom that encompasses heaven and earth, to be able to speak eloquently on all subjects. 
This is a middling virtue. To be brave and fierce, resolute and determined, gathering a band of followers around you, this is the lowest kind of virtue. Any man who possesses even one of these virtues is worthy to face south and call himself the lonely one. And now here you are, General, with all three of them. You tower eight feet two inches in height. Radiance streams from your face and eyes. Your lips are like gleaming cinnabar. Your teeth like ranged seashells. Your voice attuned to the Hua Chong pitch pipe. And yet your only title is Robert Joe. If I may say so, General, this is disgraceful. A real pity indeed. But if you have a mind to listen to my proposal, then I beg to be allowed to go as your envoy south to U and Yu, north to Chu and Lu, east to Sung and Wei, and west to Qin and Chu, persuading them to create for you a great walled state, several hundred li in size, to establish a town of several hundred thousand households, and to honor you as one of the feudal lords. Then you may make a new beginning with the world. Lay down your weapons and disperse your followers. Gather together and cherish your brothers and kinsmen. And join with them in sacrifices to your ancestors. This would be the act of a sage, a gentleman of true talent, and the fondest wish of the world. Robiger, furious as ever, said, Confucius, come forward. Those who can be swayed with offers of gain or reformed by a babble of words are mere idiots, simpletons, the commonest sort of men. The fact that I am big and tall and so handsome that everyone delights to look at me, this is a virtue inherited from my father and mother. Even without your praises, do you think I would be unaware of it? Moreover, I have heard that those who are fond of praising men to their faces are also fond of damning them behind their backs. Now you tell me about this great walled state, this multitude of people, trying to sway me with offers of gain, to lead me by the nose like any common fool. But how long do you think I could keep possession of it? There is no walled state larger than the empire itself, and yet, though Yao and Shun possessed the empire, their heirs were left with less land than it takes to stick the point of an awl into. Tang and Wu set themselves up as son of heaven, yet in ages after, their dynasties were cut off and wiped out. Was this not because the gains they had acquired were so great? Moreover, I have heard that in ancient times the birds and beasts were many, and the people few. Therefore the people all nested in the trees in order to escape danger, during the day gathering acorns and chestnuts, at sundown climbing back up to sleep in their trees. Hence they were called the people of the nest builder. In ancient times the people knew nothing about wearing clothes. In summer they heaped up great piles of firewood, in winter they burned them to keep warm. Hence they were called the people who know how to stay alive. In the age of Shen Nun, the people lay down peaceful and easy, woke up wide-eyed and blank. They knew their mothers, but not their fathers, and lived side by side with the elk and the deer. They ploughed for their food, wove for their clothing, and had no thought in their hearts of harming one another. This was perfect virtue at its height. But the Yellow Emperor could not attain such virtue. He fought with Chu Lu in the field of Chou Lu until the blood flowed for a hundred li. Yao and Shun came to the throne, setting up a host of officials. Tung banished his sovereign Chu, King Wu murdered his sovereign Zhou, and from this time on, the strong oppressed the weak, the many abused the few. From Tung and Wu until the present, all have been no more than a pack of rebels and wrongdoers. And now you come cultivating the ways of kings Wen and Wu, utilizing all the eloquence in the world in order to teach these things to later generations? In your flowing robes and loose tied sash, you speak your deceits and act out your hypocrisies, confusing and leading astray the rulers of the world, hoping thereby to lay your hands on wealth and eminence. There is no worse robber than you. I don't know why, if the world calls me Robert Je, it doesn't call you Robert Confucius. With your honeyed words, you persuaded Zhu Lu to become your follower, to doff his jointy cap unbuckle his long sword and receive instruction from you so that all the world said Kung Chu knows how to suppress violence and put a stop to evil. But in the end, Zutlu tried to kill the ruler of Wei, bungled the job and they pickled his corpse and hung it up on the eastern gate of Wei. This was how little effect your teachings had on him. You call yourself a gentleman of talent, a sage. Twice they drove you out of Lu, they wiped out your footprints in Wei, made trouble for you in Chu and besieged you in Chen and Sai. No place in the empire will have you around. 
You gave instructions to Zulu, and pickling was the disaster it brought him. You can't look out for yourself to begin with, or for others either. So how could this way of yours be worth anything? There is no one more highly esteemed in the world than the Yellow Emperor, and yet even the Yellow Emperor could not perceive his virtue intact, but fought on the field of Chou Lu until the blood flowed for a hundred li. Yao was a merciless father, Shun was an unfilial son, Yu was half paralyzed, Tang banished his sovereign Chu, King Wu attacked his sovereign Zhou, and King Wen was imprisoned by Yu Li. All these seven men are held in high esteem by the world. And yet a close look shows that all of them for the sake of gain brought confusion to the truth within them, that they forcibly turned against their true form and inborn nature. For doing so, they deserve the greatest shame. When the world talks of worldly gentlemen, we hear Po Yi and Shu Chu. Yet Po Yi and Shu Chu declined the rulership of the state of Ku Chu and instead went and starved to death on Shouyang Mountain with no one to bury their bones or flesh. Pao Chao made a great show of his conduct and condemned the world. He wrapped his arm around a tree and stood there till he died. Shen Tu Ti offered a remonstrance that was unheeded. He loaded a stone onto his back and threw himself into a river where the fish and turtles feasted on him. Chu Se Tua was a model of fealty, going as far to cut off a piece of flesh from his thigh to feed his lord, Duke Wen. But later, when Duke Wen overlooked him, he went off in a rage, wrapped his arms around a tree, and burned to death. Wei Sheng made an engagement to meet a girl under a bridge. The girl failed to appear, and the water began to rise. But instead of leaving, he wrapped his arms around the pillar of the bridge and died. These six men were no different from a flayed dog, a pig sacrificed to the flood, a beggar with his arms gored in his hand. All were ensnared by thoughts of reputation and looked lightly on death failing to remember the source or to cherish the years that fate had given them. When the world talks about loyal ministers, we are told that there are none to surpass Prince Pikan and Wu Zhe Shi. Yet Wu Zhe Shi sank into the river and Pikan had his heart cut out. These two men are called loyal ministers by the world, and yet they ended up the laughing stock of the empire. Looking at all these men, from the first I mentioned down to Wu Zhe Shi and Pikan, it is obvious that none is worth respecting. Now in this sermon of yours, Confucius, if you tell me about the affairs of ghosts, then I have no way of judging what you say. But if you tell me about the affairs of men, and it is no more than what you have said so far, then I've heard it all already. And now I'm going to tell you something about man's true form. His eyes yearn to see colors, his ears to hear sound, his mouth to taste flavors, his will and spirit to achieve fulfillment. A man of the greatest longevity will live a hundred years, one of middling longevity 80 years, and one of the least longevity 60 years. Take away the time lost in nursing illnesses, mourning the dead, worrying and anxiety, and in this life there are no more than four or five days in a month when a man can open his mouth and laugh. <laughs> Heaven and earth are unending, but man has his time of death. Take this time-bound toy, put it down in these unending spaces, and whoosh! It is over as quickly as the passing of a swift horse glimpsed through a crack in the wall. No man who is incapable of gratifying his desires and cherishing the years fate has given him can be called a master of the way. What you have been telling me, I reject every bit of it. Quick now! Be on your way! I want no more of your talk. This way you tell me about is inane and inadequate. A fraudulent, crafty, vain, hypocritical affair. Not the sort of thing that is capable of preserving the truth within. How can it be worth discussing? Confucius bowed twice and scurried away. Outside the gate, he climbed into his carriage and fumbled three times in an attempt to grasp the reins. His eyes blank and unseen, his face the colour of dead ashes. Leaning on the crossbar, head bent down, he could not seem to summon up any spirit at all. Returning to Lu, he arrived just outside the eastern gate of the capital when he happened to meet Lu Shaji. I haven't so much as caught sight of you for the past several days, said Lu Shaji, and your carriage and horses look as though they've been out on the road. It couldn't be that you went to see my brother Robert Jer, could it? Confucius looked up to heaven, sighed and said, I did. And he was enraged by your views, just as I said he would be, said Lu Shaji. He was, said Confucius. You might say that I gave myself the burning moxa treatment when I wasn't even sick. 
I went rushing off to pat the tiger's head and plate its whiskers, and very nearly didn't manage to escape from its jaws. <laughs>